Congratulations, you're the only person on the planet that missed graveyard cars last week. Here's what you missed. Last time, the ghouls concluded the epic builds of Chris Jacobs' 1968 GTX and the first of its kind, 1970 Plymouth Superbird, equipped with a Hellcat Crate Hemi. With SEMA in the rearview mirror, the ghouls begin the final assembly of a 1969 Plymouth GTX in seafoam turquoise. They're coming to get you, Bob. Just working on ordering some parts right now for our 426 Hemi for our 66 Hemi Charger. This is a car that we've been working on for quite a while and it's finally made it through the shop to a point where um, we can actually start ordering a few pieces. I've got the engine out being built right now so I'm looking at the different camshafts and uh, after that I'm going to put in a body order with Classic Industries and be interrupted by my wonderful daughter Alyssa. Hi. Hello Alyssa. Hey, I have a gift here from you. I don't. Is that really still your background? Really? The silver hammer. It's pretty cool. Oh, wow. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, Isn't that's that cool? cute. We've got the light in the box. How cool that oh, is. Oh, wow. Look at you that. A 420. Isn't oh, it's actually cool? a ring. Yeah, oh, God, that's, that's a ring. Look at that. <laughs> that looks really good on that. That's actually really cool. Check that bad Joe. All right, so now that we got our beautiful Tribute Superbird with the first ever Hell Crate engine installed and controller, uh, we can get kind of back to things being normal around here. It was pretty manic there for a while. Uh, don't get me wrong, there's 102 cars in progress right now, so we're always a little manic. So one of the first cars I want to get started on is one of the closest ones to being done. It's our 1969 GTX. It's a 440 automatic Sea foam turquoise, do so you recognize the Q5 code? Our Hemi Roadrunner last season was a Q5 sea foam turquoise. This car has a black top, black interior. Pretty neat little color scheme, 440 automatic, not a lot of options on it. Why didn't he select a lot of options? I'm gonna take some time here shortly and I'm gonna show you why. I'm gonna show you the book that he selected it from with all of the options that were available and what those options could have cost. While I'm doing that, I'm gonna let Doug build out the engine, get it all put together, get all the bits and pieces put on it so we can move it down to Will. My goal is Doug builds the engine, Will paints it, Doug gets the rest of the suspension ready to go in, we get all the pieces under the hood, bolt it in, and we can put a drivetrain in it this week. So that's the goal. We're gonna use an original book that the dealers used back in the day. This was how color and trim and other options were uh, picked out by a potential buyer of a car. So again, this is an original piece of nomenclature from 1969. We open it up, we can see right here it says 1969 Plymouth Review. There's some notes in here, but you know that this is an authentic Chrysler, Plymouth Chrysler Division book. I have our fender tag marking the GTX area, but so we'll just set the fender tag right over here. If we look at our tag, we're gonna talk about the colors and the trim right now, not the R11, which is the radio, but let's talk about the V1X. That means it gets a black vinyl top. The body color is Q5, that's seafoam turquoise. So if we were sitting on that showroom floor right now trying to pick out the color of our new GTX, we'd take this and open it up to the seafoam turquoise. So Doug is my cousin. That's why I call him Cousin Dougie or Cousin Duct Tape or whatever. Uh, we just grew up together, so we're not just relatives, but we're really good friends. Doug is a really good, conscientious technician. He knows right out to go to the wall and get this wire retainer kit, this heat shield kit. So yeah, he's at a point now where I think he's really enjoying it. He's able to get past all the nervy things and really take his time and do a good job. These were all colors that were available. So this is the color that matches this right here. If you take the tag over there, they're pretty close. The other thing on our tag, you'll see is V6W. 
That's the accent stripe, the longitudinal accent stripe. So at the back of this book, the salesman could pull out these little swatches here, white one. So you can lay that down over it. But there's, the, there's your outside colors. You have your turquoise, you have your white, and then you would have a black vinyl top, which they don't actually have the swatch of in here. Then on the interior colors, they went with the basic black. So this is the page. These are actual, real samples of the material that was put on the assembly line cars. This is, this is the cool part. Now this gentleman picked out P6X. The P meant it was premium, the six meant bucket seats, and the X meant black. So he has black bucket seat interior. P6X, you see it right there. This color combination, now this has an insert and an outer edge to the seat. That's why there's two different textures that make up that seat, but that's your black material. It was available on all Sport Satellite and GTX colors. So no matter what color the outside of the car was, you could get a black interior. The thing about Doug is he's a man of few words. If you watch him, I mean, it's, it's not like he dummies up when the cameras come on. That's just who he is. He's just a man of few words. He's a deep thinker, right? He's that guy on the stone, you know, made out of stone, that's thinking all the time. He's always thinking. I think he's proud to work here. I bet he's probably proud of the fact, because he knows where I came from, that we, this is really a self-built thing just by hard work and, and dedication and believing in a dream. I imagine he feels that way, and he probably is more apt to share that with other people than with me. So again, there's all kinds of combinations, but there's also not every combination in the world. Let's say you liked a tan interior. This, this hideous color right here, P6T. Said, I want that interior, and I want it with a blue outside. What well, wasn't available? You can see here, F3, F5, F8, those are your greens. L1, which is our sand pebble, sand pebble, sorry, I think, see? It was available with that color. Uh, the T7 coppers was available with them right there. So it was never available with some of these other colors. So the main point of all that is, if you're building a car today, you can't, unless you're, unless you're deviating from the fender tag right here, then you have to stay within what was available from the factory. And there's nothing on this planet that's gonna be more accurate than the original book that you ordered from back in 1969. Now that Doug has the engine wrapped up, I'm gonna go get Alyssa, we're gonna go into the training. Mickey versus Rocky, Rocky versus Apollo, right? So I'm like Rocky and, I'm, I'm like Mickey and Rocky, right? I'm both characters and she's gonna be more like a trainee. She's gonna be, oh, Tommy Gunn. She could be Tommy Gunn, remember? Then later he turned on her like when she stole my car. So that's actually, you know, yeah, that's weird. History kind of like, huh, what do they call it? Truth is stranger than fiction? So what I wanna start with you guys is the B engine, what Mopar called their B series big block engines. What we're doing is we've got some 440s, 383s, 426ME short blocks that we're getting ready to build out. I thought this might be a good opportunity with everything laid out to be able to walk Alyssa through how to be able to eyeball a B engine from an RB engine from a 426ME. So we're gonna talk about that. I stand corrected on one thing on the B engines just because I'm kind of anal retentive about this, I wanna point it out. I mentioned that there's the 361, the 383, and the 400 are B engines. In 1958, and all of you Christine fans will know this, they introduced the B engine, and it was a 350 cubic inch called the Golden Commando with the inline dual fours available on it. That was the engine that Christine had in it. So technically, there were four B engines. Just the odds of us actually working on a 350, I think is why I omitted it. But I'm willing to admit when I make a mistake. So 361, 383, and 400 are your B series engines. Okay. 361, 383. 383, and 400. Okay. Okay, now let's just And move. this is a 383. And this is a 383, because remember here on this pad, you've got D383. When you see the D right there and the 383, you're gonna start with 1965 had an A. 1966 was a B, 1967 was a C, 1968 was a D, 69 was an E, and 70 was an F, and on up through the alphabet, 71 would have been G. So when you see D383, that date is not the date this was cast, that's on the side of the block in raised lettering. Okay. Stamped into this is the date that the engine was assembled. The long block assembly was done. So it was intended to go in a 68 model car. 
Now this is the one that for the most part, most of the cars that we have here are RB series engines. Then the other big block that they've got is the legendary Elephant, the 426 Hemi, which could never, ever be mistaken with a 440. The main difference when you look at these are, are a couple of things. First off, you notice they both have this machined off pad right here. Yes. You see this area here? Mm -hmm. What does that read on there? 440. What's in F. the front? F. 440. So what year is that engine? 71. It's still a 70. Okay. Alphabet's still working the way it did when I, I was I think it was school. my math that was off a little there. I think it's, it's stressful. It's like the McMetric system at McDonald's. Remember <sighs> when they introduced the McMetric system? You did good. Thank you. Okay. This one also has the machined off pad, but on it, what does it read? You're only asking because you can't see, huh? 3H420. If that wasn't a 3 and we know it has to be an alpha, what is it? Probably a B. Okay, so it's a 1966 426 Hemi, and that's actually what it's going in is a 66 Hemi charger. So on our 426 Hemi, you've got, let's just take the number two main journal, this one right here. Great big bolt, great big bolt. That's what you see over here on the number two main journal of the 440. Mm -hmm. That's it for the 440. That's all that holds that crankshaft in the saddle is those, those two. two bolts. You go to the Hemi, which is a high performance, meant to go fast, later went into drag racing, ran nitro on them, and these things were born to boogie. They not only had these two here, but they also had a cross bolt. This also was the extra webbing in the block and the extra strength to hold this bottom in together under blunt force trauma, like maybe the backfire of a I blower or something like that. So we're just getting started on the tutorials. Absolutely thrilled about this because it's a chance for me to share some of the things that I know that they should know, and maybe in Doug's case, he does know. It's also cool because right on topic, we're gonna be putting an RB440 in our 1969 GTX. So this is, a, this is a great opportunity for her to really soak up some good knowledge. Right after the break, Alyssa provides us with some history on the Plymouth Cudas. Dave answers questions you've sent in, and Mark pulls out the Dave Weiss book to teach you how to find the correct OE bolts for your at-home restoration. Did you know that the most expensive Mopar ever sold at auction was a 1971 426 Hemi four-speed convertible Hemi Cuda. It sold for a whopping $3.5 million. It's true. I mean, you can Google it. In 1971, Chrysler sold only 16,159 Plymouth Barracudas and Cudas. Only 108 of those were Hemi Cuda Coupes, 11 of which were convertibles, but only two of those were four-speeds. Rarer still, of the two four-speed cars, only one was numbers matching. So. Is that 3.5 million starting to make a little more sense now? Because that makes it a one of one car by default. The Plymouth Barracuda was around for about a decade, from 1964 to 1974, but are best remembered for two of those years, 1970 and 1971. Now, if you have a personal preference for one year over the other, that's okay, because both years have a history that's worth noting, and they both certainly have value. But when we think of a CUDA, we think of 1970 and 1971, whether or not it's a CUDA or a Barracuda. The 1964 Barracuda was derived from the Plymouth Valiant and was introduced on April Fool's Day, 1964, but it was no joke. It was built for battle against the Mustang. Mopar built 23,000 Barracudas, which isn't bad for a mid-year introduction, but that's nothing in comparison to the over 120,000 Mustangs that were produced after their April 1964 release. A fun fact about the first generation Barracuda is that the 14.4 square foot rear window was the largest ever installed on a standard production car at that time. Another interesting fact is the name, okay? The Plymouth execs wanted to call it the Panda. Thank God that didn't happen. Fortunately, they lost to the designers and today we have the Barracuda. But in 1969, it was the first year of the short name Cuda. So that helped a little bit because that made it really cool. In 1970, the redesign cut ties with the Valiant. 70 through 71 was the pinnacle of the Barracuda. While the 1969 Cuda was the first year a 440 was offered in the smaller A-body platform, the horsepower and the new CUDA name, it just wasn't enough. But in 1970, the CUDA had everything. Every performance engine was available from the 340 up to the 426 Hemi. But as quickly as the 70 through 71 CUDAs rose to greatness, it was all over by 1972. In 1972, there was only one performance engine option, and that's the 340. So no more big blocks or rubber bumpers, shaker hoods, convertibles rear window louvers, or anything else that screamed cool. Like, they were done with it. They didn't want any more cool. 
So even though they may be rare, the 70 to 71 Cudas are the most sought after and the most valuable Mopar. First thing I want to talk about is the 915 cylinder head and the 906. Now there was also a third one, and what they're referring to is the last three digits of the casting number. If you look at this cylinder head, the 906, 906 is 1968 to 1970, 383, 440, HP and non-HP, all use the 906 heads. The valves use double springs on the high performance versus the single spring. So you see that other spring inside there? Yeah. That means this probably was off of an HP engine, or you might not see that on a non-HP engine. One of the things that I have noticed over the years with myself is when you know something firsthand, you tend to rattle through it. It makes perfect sense to you. You've done it a thousand times. So the 915 was one year only, 19, I believe. Now, I could be wrong on that. It could have been 66 and 67, but I want to say I think it's just 67. I'm trying to be slow and trying to show the intricate differences between these engines, the B versus the RB and the Hemi, and that's referred to as the closed chamber head. I believe she's absorbing some of it, probably more even than she thinks she's absorbing. But at the end of the day, she'll have to be kind of like I am, where you go over it and over it and over it until it's second nature. So like Royal's Crap Box, Baby Poop Green 1967 Coronet RT, it has 915 heads on it. You want to write now, that down too? What would you say? You said it was Baby, uh, baby, baby Poop Crap Box 67 RT, non-numbers car. But I do think the basic absorption is starting to happen and the desire to absorb is starting to happen. So, I mean, that's the foundation for learning. Thank you for writing that down. You're welcome. Don't want us to forget that. No. <laughs> the Holly induction system, which featured three two-barrel carburetors, on a Dodge was called a 446 pack. On a Plymouth, it was called a 446 barrel. What was the introductory year for the legendary three two-barrel Holley system. Was it 1967, 1969, or 1970? The answer coming up after the break. All right, ghouls, how did you do? What was the very first year of the model year that the 446 pack was introduced? The multiple Holley carburetor? The answer is 1969. As a matter of fact, it's referred to as the 1969 and a half Roadrunner and Super B. That was the first time the induction system showed up. It was available in 70 on a 340 as well as a 440, and it was available only on a 440 in 1971. By 1972, no more fun, no more multiple carburetors. This is kind of gonna dispel a couple of myths. Yep. These will both bolt on the same engines. I could put this on a 7440 and I could put this on a 67. Okay. The only difference is it would change the compression ratio, and here's why. When I roll the 915 up like that, and I roll our 906 up like that. So on the 915 head in 67, this is called a closed head. And they're referring to the combustion chamber. You see this is open right here, mm -hmm. and, it, and, and it has an indent, and it's wide open and matches the shape of the piston. This one is closed through here. This whole area is filled in. That would raise the compression of the engine. However, that would make you think, well, a 67 440 would have higher compression than, say, a 68 440. It didn't. They both had 10.1. They changed the height, the finish height of the piston to compensate for it. So the purpose behind it, I'm not 100% sure, but this had a 10.1 compression ratio and this had a final 10.1, unless it was a 446 pack, which was introduced in 1969 and a half, and they used even a higher piston and they were at 10.5 to one compression ratio. And they controlled that with the height of the piston. But this is a closed chamber, this is an open chamber. From 1968 to 1970, all of our engines are gonna have this head on it. All of our 440s and 383 are gonna have that head. Yep. In 1967, if we ever work on a dung box like Royals, it's gonna, it's gonna get that one. Okay. Okay. It's been taking a little bit longer with Doug and Alyssa on the, the differences in the engines, but that's okay. I think they're absorbing it. Uh, like I say, it's just a little bit longer than I had hoped. In my mind, I don't mind taking longer. It normally is just fine. I still wanna get my drivetrain in the GTX, so if we can wrap it up, that'll be a good thing. That bad boy, that mother, 
Is that the Hemi? That's the 426 Hemi. Notice the size of it. Let's just take that little critter right there, and let's just take it's these. Like, these both have the same footprint. So let's put the 915 up next well, to it. Well, it's like two of these. Yeah, literally. Coming up, Mark concludes his engine tutorial with Doug and Alyssa, pulls out the Dave Weiss books to teach you how to find the correct OE bolts, and gathers the crew to help him get the drivetrain installed in our 1969 Plymouth GTX in seafoam turquoise. Hey guys, Dave here at Graveyard Cars. I'm the assembly tech here in the assembly room. We had a lot of fans send in a lot of questions on the internet, so I'm gonna answer a few of them. Here we go. This one's from Scott from Facebook. He asks, I'm restoring a 1971 Charger 500. I find it difficult to find certain parts. What do you do when you can't find a part for cars? To answer your question, we find it really difficult to find parts too. Mark is constantly on eBay trying to search parts. And of course there's Tony's parts. Tony has a great selection of parts. But eBay, I think in the internet, a lot of these Dodge and Mopar websites have a great forum column where you can kind of write in want ads and stuff when you're looking for certain parts. So you really got to do research and use that internet. That's, that's what we do. All right, I got one more here. This one's coming from Steven or Stefan, I'm sorry if I got that wrong, uh, off of Facebook. And he asks, what were the differences between the 1966 and 67 Chargers? Okay, there's a few on there. Uh, as you know, the 1966 and 67 Chargers, first generation, had that fastback. It's kind of a love-hate. People either love them or hate them. Uh, but the differences between the two uh, was the center console. In 1966, the center console was super cool. It ran the full length all the way down through the back seat, had the full length going all the way back. In 67, they actually shortened that up and they cut it off. So right behind the front seat is where the console ended, the center console. Uh, another option was, in 1966, you had an option of getting fender-mounted turn signals. In 1967, they were standard uh, having fender-mounted turn signals. And then uh, a big difference would be in 1967, they added the 440 HP, uh, the 440 Magnum engine in 1967. It wasn't available in 66. Uh, so there's your differences. And of course, they had some wheel cover uh, differences as well. Uh, but those are the three main ones. Hopefully that answers your question and uh, it's been fun. Thanks guys, take care. So far, Doug has built out the engine for Manning's GTX, while Mark taught us what options were and were not available during that time. Now, Mark concludes his engine block tutorial for Doug and Alyssa to be able to refocus efforts to get the drivetrain installed in our 1969 Plymouth GTX in seafoam turquoise. So this engine is for our 69 GTX, Manning's uh, seafoam turquoise car out there. Oh, okay. You see that bolt right there? What's the little identifying mark at the top of it? An anchor. That's right. Okay, anchor. these are the correct bolts that hold the valve covers on. Probably from 68 to 70 at least, maybe even into 71, I can't be positive of it. Out here on the outboard side, you see that this is a stud and not a bolt. Mm -hmm. That was to align the valve covers on the assembly line. Rather than using a bolt, they just threw it down over this and they had automatic alignment. There's a stud here, a stud at the back, a stud there, and a stud at that back. All right. Should be that easy, Doug. You see this yeah. bolt right here? Yeah. What does it say? TR. No, it doesn't say anything. It reads TR. <laughs> Malice, Alec Baldwin, Nicole Kidman. I guess I'm an entertainer. I'm a friend first, a boss second, and an entertainer third. Okay, that is the correct bolt to hold the intake manifold on this engine. Okay. So these are the things I want you to begin to absorb. Gosh. With that, class this is missed. Ajourn. <laughs> oh my God. I know that I'll never be him and never probably be where he's at because I mean, He's, I mean, he's insane with the way he memorizes stuff, and I just don't have a memory like that, but I'm gonna try as hard as I can. Can I go to work now? Can I go home? <laughs> yeah. Wait! Ha <laughs> ha, look at there! My man, sitting around, ain't doing nothing. I'm working. 
No, you're not. I would need you to come out and give me and Alyssa a hand with the 69 GTX under the hood plumbing. <laughs> yeah, that's not gonna happen. You're, I'm right in the middle of painting. You're not doing anything. You're sitting on your phone. Well, right now, but I'm still, I'm still painting in the booth. I'm in between coats. Figure it out. You told me months ago you wanted to learn how to do this stuff. I did? Yeah, you did. Well, yeah, you have a seizure? I may have. <laughs> you don't want to do it? I don't have time. You know what? I don't care. That's the thing about it. I don't care. He wants to sit down there and play on his Instagram. I don't care. He's a commission guy. I don't care. Take all day. Well, I've got a, a younger, more impressionable brain, Emma, and, I, and I'm not really capitalizing on that, right? She's a sponge. She's going to soak up my comedy, my dance moves, all that kind of stuff. Plus, she's going to be the youngest kid in the country probably working on a Mopar. Take lemons and make lemonade. It's called a lesson. Emma! g needs you. In 1970, if you bought a CUDA with a 340 and a manual four-speed transmission, you automatically got the beautiful, world-renowned pistol grip shifter. True or false, behind that 340 standard was a manual three-speed transmission. Think you know the answer? Stay tuned after the break. So true or false, if you had that high revving little 340, would it have come from the factory if you didn't option up just a three-speed manual? The answer is true. That's exactly right. Same thing for a 383. It would have been the base entry level, would have been a three-speed. However, most people optioned to go up to the four-speed, which gave you the pistol grip four-speed, the reverse light on the dash, which was super cool, and just all around better performance. So there you have it. Just because it was cheap doesn't mean it was cool. What I want to do is take just a few minutes here and teach our audience what I teach our, our ghouls out here. I'll just say get wise and they know exactly what it means. It means go into our reference room and grab our Dave Weiss manual. You open up your book, you've got your introduction, how things are laid out in there. We're going to go to the first section I have marked here, thermostat. What you have on this page is kind of a breakdown. This is what the thermostat housing should look like. These are what the bolts should look like that hold the thermostat housing in place. According to Mr. Weiss, the bolt that holds that housing in place is 3 8 in diameter. 16 means it's a coarse thread, and it has a one inch overall length. They show you here where to measure that at. Here's the bolt specs. I'll pick up one of those. This is the AMK replica bolt. If you look carefully, you'll see that the new replica bolt isn't as tall in the head as the factory original one. Main thing we want to make sure is that Dave is right. And I ended up with, at the very end of the thread, 989 thousandths. So one million is an inch. So right there is exactly what he's calling for, which is your one inch. We know that it's a 3 8 thread. You can always double check it if you want to with your calipers. And we end up with almost 400,000, 397 thousandths. That's our 3 8 So we know that is exactly the correct bolt. Dave has the Highland bolt on the left, and then he has another version that could possibly happen here on the right. This has got a D on it. He has pulled some engines apart that have that D in it. So if you're pulling an engine apart and it doesn't have the Highland bolt, but you swear it was an original, you could use that bolt right there and you'd still be correct. So again, there's a lot of knowledge right there that's really helpful when you put one of these cars together correctly. And those are all the fun little parts of what we call around here getting wise. So we'll catch you on the next one. Hi, Doug. Will, I got a 69 383 engine for Manning's GTX that needs to be painted right away. What do you mean right away? Or well, right now? <laughs> See, I, I have it out here on the forklift right now, and it's raining outside. Well, Doug, I was going to paint all this stuff for Dave first, so I got time for that. Well, can I bring it in here? So basically, I just need to drop what I'm doing, pull all this stuff out, and get a motor in here for Mark. Is that a problem? We had to problem. Doug. Odd dude. Weird to talk to, can't get any answers out of. So that's, that's Doug. Good luck in life having a discussion with him. So you need this back today? No. I just need it painted today. Doug. What? You're exhausting. I know. <laughs> it's, it's very simple. Uh -huh. You say you need it painted right now. Yeah. Okay, so you need it today. I just need it painted because it's ready to go and it needs to be in the car soon. 
You're special, Doug. <laughs> Thank You're you, a Will. special man. Thank you. Why is she sending you mad faces? Because she said they Alyssa? look cute. Yeah? Why aren't you in the office? I don't understand. I just got done with lunch. I have a question for this young lady. Eh. Emma, I have a question for you. Um, are you terribly busy right now? No. You're not, okay. Oh, no, no, you sure? I'm getting ready to work on a 1969 GTX. Can you say that? Um, GTX? Very good, very good. Um, we're going to plumb out underneath the hood, like the power brake booster and stuff like that. Would you be willing to give your mother and I a hand doing that? Yes. Really? Now, you've worked with me before, so it shouldn't be any problem. You know what all the tools are. I'll help you. Um, so... You know all the tools are. You know. Okay, you want to help? Yep. All right, I'll see you guys out there. Okay. Okay. Get ready. Uh, Let's go. I'm gonna go send him. I got a special shirt for you to wear. Okay. So what I'm doing right now is just getting the pieces ready to go underneath the car until the girls get out here. Um, we're gonna put the horns in, power brake booster, master cylinder, that kind of stuff. Um, once that's in place, then we can lower the car down around it, uh, put the suspension and everything in it. So there. Ah! <laughs> there's there's the G daughter. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, I like the tiger. Yes. Is the tiger gonna help? I love it, I love it. Okay, let's set the tiger right here. Business tiger, it's a business tiger. There, I like it. Mm -hmm. Alyssa. Yep. You and I are going inside the engine compartment. We Emma. both gonna be able to fit in there? I, well, I don't know, maybe if you lost I, some. I don't think I'm the one we're worried about here. Uh, yeah, this happens to be a condition, so. <laughs> All right. Be before before we get started, I, I am not Vern Troyer. Can you raise the car up in the air a little bit so I can stand up and not be hunched over? It'd be sure. great. Is that good? Keep going, keep going, Mary. A little more, Yolanda. Right there, Shaniqua. Got it. Okay, uh, Emma Marie Rose, the four silver chromy looking nuts right there in front of you. There's four of them, yep. Put all four of those in your hand. Is there four? That's three. Oh. Yeah, you're le you're, you learned your math from your mommy. Okay, you're gonna have to get inside the car. And okay, I need the plate, uh, Emma Marie. Yep, got one right there. And a gasket, perfect. Good job, all right. Um, go. All right, if you've got the nuts started, is that true? Yes. Go ahead and tighten them down and I'll hold it in place. Okay. About as tight as I can get them finger wise. Well, no, use the, the electric. Oh, okay. No, she's not. Do the top one. Portion valve. Make sure you don't scratch the car. Thank you. Well, right that's... there is a bolt. Perfect. I'll take that and that. So, Emma, this is the windshield wiper motor. Go ahead and hand that to your mom. So, here. Can you screw one of those on there? There you go, and then and you want to go like a clock like this here. Keep going. Take that back, thank you. Watch this, this makes it so much easier. Good job, we did it. All right, Emma, hold that right there. Do you know what that is called? Yeah. What is it? Uh, I forgot. It's yeah. called a voltage? Voltage? Regulator. Regulator. Very good. Can you hold that right there? Uh -huh. This could just be a little overly optimistic on my part, but I have a feeling when Emma's done, she's gonna be teaching Alyssa some things. Now, that's not meant to be disparaging. Alyssa's a sharp gal, but Emma's picking it up really good. And what better would, what, what greater reward for a Mopar lover and father to have his daughter and his granddaughter end up knowing as much as he does? Which probably is impossible, obviously. They're not walking computers. Okay, there is that. And that is called a ballast resistor. Ballast resistor. You like working out here? Okay. What's that last part we put on? A ballast resistor. Gosh, that's amazing. What's the other it part? It look bad. A voltage regulator. Perfect. Wiper motor. And this is a power brake booster. And this? Master cylinder. That's all I'm talking about. That's all I'm talking about. Okay. You know, I'm I'm having an absolute thrill with, with having Emma out here working. It's 
I mean, I don't want to get misty-eyed over it, but I love her, right? I mean, this is a great chance for grandpa and the granddaughter to get together and hang out and talk about the things I love. And she's showing a real interest in it. So uh, she's doing a good job, too. I mean, yeah, she didn't know every technicality. I mean, few people really do. But uh, when I say, hey, it's four of these or it's three of that, she goes right over and grabs it and hands it to me. Just, it's adorable. I could work with her all day long and, I, and my blood pressure would never go over 80 over 120. 120 over 80. I think the other one would kill me. Okay, honey, this is the last part we gotta put on. This is called the Windshield Washer Reservoir. Windshield. Perfect. Washer. Washer Reservoir. Beautiful. Look at that. See, I started too late with you. That's the problem. She's already got it. She's six. She's already got it. Hand that to your mother. I'm seven. Whatever. Yeah, Grandpa. Okay, you know what? I'm trying to look out for you. One day you're going to say I'm only 54 instead of 55. Trust me, it's going to happen. All right, you're doing good. Spike the camera like Grandpa does, too. Okay, Emma, good job. You put the necessary pieces on under the hood of a 1969 GTX. What is this car? GTX. What year is it? Um, 69. 69. Very good. good. First four characters of the VIN? Yeah. Why do you do that to me? Uh, so Emma and I and Alyssa just finished working on the 69 GTX. Well, how do you think it went? Good. Yeah, I think you did pretty good. You know, for your first time really turning wrenches, I think you did pretty darn good, to be honest. You know how to give everybody the look. Let's, uh, let's try to look right at that camera over there. Right there. Three, two, one. So we're doing really well on the GTX. This is our 69 440 automatic Q5 car, another seafoam color. Uh, very neat car, very rare, very uh, desirable. Remember, this is a numbers matching drivetrain. So this is a really neat car. The gentleman's father bought it brand new. And so I'm really excited to be at this point. We're finally ready to put the drivetrain in it. We can get the wheels and tires on it, lower it down, roll it forward, and then Dave can finish putting the interior together. So we're getting really close to having that one done. That's, that's a very good feeling, and I know the owner's gonna be thrilled too. I don't anticipate anything going wrong. I mean, these guys have done a couple of them with me, so I think uh, they're, they've got it down now to a point hey, where... Yeah, I've got them loose for a reason. So they're easier to go in, they're more slack. They line up the front. I take that back. Yeah, there's a lot that could go wrong. Okay. Let's slide that thing down here. Okay, well, now, there's a car here we don't want to scratch and one behind you. Let Oops. us know where we can go. Come on down. Okay. I plan on going around the light this way. That's fine. Was that your plan? Yeah, that's I fine. want you to come right down here. Okay, now. Uh, and right through there. Oh, sweet, don't. Don't scratch well, Don't car. hire the car, though. Whatever we do, let's not do I that. I won't hire the car. I won't hire the car. Don't hire the that car. car doesn't meet our hiring requirements. So let me go up with the car Here's a little your... bit in the air. You raise. We're yeah, hire whatever. The car. <laughs> you guys, this just gives me that. That's what I got for my, that was funny. You're not hundred grand worth of education. I use that word a lot. I'm sure you do. <laughs> okay, I hired the car. I'm not high enough. I try to get hired. Thanks for hired. Yeah, See, the car's saying? hired. So let's go put it in. <laughs> oh, let's oh, not. Sweet. Okay. <laughs> This isn't just, what You're do you mean? talking about working out at the gym and busting walnuts with your ass cheeks. I, Get in there I, and reef that son of a did. down. Okay, let's oh. stop and line up these front K member holes. Remember, Alyssa? Hang on, you crazy baboon. I didn't do anything. Let's go forward a little bit. Right there. Perfect. We're going to want these up out of the way over to here as far as they'll go. That's a perfect alignment. That might be the best one we've done yet. You're welcome. Thank you, buddy. That was a thank you. Well, the looks are getting good. OK, we're really close here. Yeah, going higher. Kind of higher it up. This is scaring the OK. Higher it up here. Will, if 
if you will round up the wheels and tires of his choice, he's going with a 68 style wheel that's been widened a little bit. I'll grab them. They're in the machine shop. They got a, I think they got a I'll TA help. on them, TA radial. Now, now, in fairness, when you look at these wheels and tires, they're, they're on a car and they're rolling down the road, you don't realize they weigh something. That's a big wheel and tire. That's a 275 on a steel rim that's probably eight inches wide. There's a lot of weight to it. Don't be stupid. What took so long? Are you gonna put the small ones on the back? Cracking walnuts with your ass? Oh shit, she almost went back. <laughs> she just does ass squats, because somebody out there in TV land told her she had a fat ass, thank you for that. So all she does is ass squats at the gym, so she don't have this upper body. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Like me, I'm a push-up man, you know? I like to go vertically upside down, just do push-ups all day. So yeah, I had to go help her out. Don't act like I'm not helping. Well, you aren't. You're making it worse. You're shoving it all over the damn place. All right, now this is the pace I'm looking to set at Graveyard Cars, just like this, right? You have a goal, you get the goal done in a day-by-day -day basis so that at the end of the week, it can culminate in what we have. A 1969 Plymouth GTX is now rolling under its own power for the first time in many, many years. It's called a victory. It's the kind of victory that you don't want to take a lap necessarily over it, but you want to use it as a springboard for the next 20 or 30 cars that are in here. All right, good job. Good job. Good job, Willie. Liza. <laughs> don't touch me. Ow. <laughs> good job, good job. All right, that's it. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to start putting the rest of the interior together. Wow. That's that does look do cool, here. though. Look at that black stripe. The A-Team. That's cool. The A-Team. Yeah, that's good. Say something funny. See, you're not natural funny. comedian like me. Huh? There's only room on this show for one, that's Dad. Cool. <laughs> I think we had a really good week. Would you say we had a good week? You helped out a lot, I wanna thank you very much. Well, Doug got the engine and the transmission and everything ready to go in the car. Then I was in big trouble. I had to go to the E-Meister General, Echo Bomb 3000, I call her, Emma, and she helped me put the engine together, engine compartment together with her mother, uh, Alyssa. And I think that went good. We had a helper that day. What was the helper's name? I haven't named it yet. You haven't named it? Can we name a uh, Mark? You already have, there already is a mark. Yeah, okay, he could be Tiger Mark, though. How about, oh, I know. My favorite character when I was growing up in Winnie the Pooh was Tigger. Could we call him Tigger? Tigger it is. Tigger helped us put together the engine compartment on our GTX. And once we had that done, we were able to bolt the drivetrain in, lower the car down, and roll it forward. What do you think of the dance moves I've been working with you on? Um, hilarious. And funny. We got muscle boom we got to down like that, right? And muscle boom over there like that. Out. Now you're getting the groove. Each morning I wake up. I put on my makeup. And I say a little prayer for you. Forever and ever you'll be in my heart. That's number one right there. Rock and roll, everybody. <laughs>